the standards now, the, the primary standards and regulations all call for monitoring water systems, not necessarily requiring testing for Legionella, but testing for conditions that can affect Legionella. So that, that's why this topic is so important now, especially. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what to monitor, what parameters, where in the system to do that, and then how to do that. But first, let's talk about why. Again, some of the, some of the documents that are requiring it, uh, uh, VHA Directive 1061. Um, the new standard by Joint Commission that hospitals accredited by Joint Commission have to follow calls for it. The Association of Drinking, State Drinking Water Administrators, along with the Association of Territorial, State and Territorial Health Officials, came out with a document specifically on monitoring water quality. And it's in ASHRAE 188, and the CDC has a document on monitoring water quality. In fact, in their Water Management Plan checklist, they have a list of parameters to consider testing for. So all of these documents require it. And so let's talk about, well, why do they require it? I mean, why does it make sense from a risk reduction standpoint to test not just for Legionella, but for conditions that can affect Legionella? And I think it's a good idea to test for Legionella because the data is very useful, but you have to understand the limitations of it. So one would be that Legionella will not tell you exactly what factors contributed to it. So if you get unacceptable test results, you don't know exactly what it was. Well, do you have inadequate temperatures, inadequate disinfectants? Is it, is it water age? Um, what is the problem? So, so, so think about it from a, a medical test. Like if, if your doctor tells you you need to lower your bad cholesterol and you don't want to take medication to do that. So you start monitoring the factors that can affect your cholesterol, what, what you eat and how much exercise and so forth. Um, the cholesterol test is kind of the bottom line test, but it doesn't tell you exactly what you need to change to improve on your results. So another reason, another limitation of Legionella tests is it doesn't, it, it's not going to help you immediately respond to conditions that you need to respond to immediately. So let's say that there's a water main break or um, that, that introduces contaminated water into the system or uh, heavy construction that, that shakes pipes to the extent that sediment and films are released, which can affect Legionella results, but you're not testing for Legionella often enough. It's not practical to do that every day. It's too expensive, and the tests don't get analyzed quick enough to get the results anyway to be able to respond immediately to those events. But monitoring conditions at, a point, at the point of entry to a building can alert you to those um, situations that need an immediate response. And this is probably the biggest reason. The biggest limitation is that few facilities test adequately for Legionella. Um, uh, the percentage that, that test at all is pretty low. And then if you look at the ones, who, even the ones who are testing, the ones who test enough locations in a domestic water system, I'll use the words domestic water system and potable water system interchangeably. Um, they, they may not test enough locations or the right locations. They may not use the right sample type, pre-flush, post-flush, hot, cold, and so forth, uh, swab versus water, to answer the questions that need to be answered. And probably what's the biggest problem, we talked about this a little bit in the panel yesterday, is that they do not respond well to the test results. They, they don't know how. And even if they go to get advice, a lot of times they don't get good advice from a consultant, from an industrial hygienist, from an engineer, and unfortunately even and I won't say especially, but including from health officials, Sometimes the health departments. Um, back when I was doing uh, quite a bit of expert witness work, I saw that over and over again, it is that uh, this facility got in a really bad spot, but it was in part because, well, they didn't correct the action, the, correct the problem quickly enough because they were getting bad advice from the health department. So to go about testing these conditions, what should you test? And you can probably guess some of these, because if you've read much at all about Legionella, you know it's affected by temperature, it's infected by, affected by the levels of disinfectants, and the disinfection power or effectiveness for some disinfectants, especially chlorine, and to some extent chlorine dioxide and monochloramine and copper silver ions are affected by pH, so that's commonly recommended as well. Um, what else? I'm, um, what other parameters can you think of? Can you think of three other ones that you might test for to um, give you an indication of 
how to manage your water systems for Legionella control. Sediment. sediment, like particulate? Yeah, yeah, what else? Dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen, now that's not one I've heard of, but, um, but uh, since a Legionella is aerobic, I guess that, that, could, be, that could be useful. Um, flow. Uh, to measure water age in some way or another, maybe? And what about conductivity and turbidity? If you measure that at the point of entry, if you get a spike in that, obviously you start from a ba the baseline of what the, you're getting from the city. But if you see a spike, um, that might be something to react to initially, uh, immediately that indicates a, a problem is going on. And then where in the system? We already talked about the point of entry. Um, it depends in part on the parameter. So you're not gonna measure all of them everywhere. Some of them, um, a lot of them you'll measure at the point of entry, but some at the points of use. It depends on the parameter, it depends on the technology available to test for that parameter and the difficulty in doing that. So besides points of entry and points of use, where else can you think of? So for temperatures, for example, where, where might you also test temperature? Hot water return, yeah. Um, water heater outlet maybe, or mixing valve outlet. Yeah, so, so back to those medical tests, you could kind of, you could think about uh, temperature and disinfectants and pH and, and probably flow as well as, as for a cholesterol test, you know, the, the exercise and the, and the diet monitoring. So if you get off your, diet for a day or you, you skip a workout, it's not, like, it's not like death is around the corner. You know, it's not something that's, that's alarming. It's just something that over time and uh, cumulative can, can affect the cholesterol results. So that, that's kind of what, how you would look at temperatures and disinfectants, pH of flow, whereas conductivity and turbidity, if those spike, that would be more like um, your heart rate in, increasing very rapidly or um, and, and forgive me, I know these analogies aren't perfect, I'm not a doctor, but, but um, oxygen level, maybe your oxygen level went down significantly and, and, you, and that requires medical help. So, so that's something that you would react to right away. Um, so how do, you, how do you go about doing this? Well, in most facilities, pretty much all facilities, there's going to be some combination of sensors and handheld devices. So you can't do everything with sensors. You're gonna to have to do some handheld device measurements. And how that combination is from facility to facility is going to vary depending in part on the, their budget because the upfront cost for the sensors and the installation can um, affect that. And then the, whether or not the facility has a building automation system will affect it. Um, requirements too, there might be specific requirements of a standard or of a local regulation that the facility has to comply with that may require a handheld device just based on the, the detection limits or the particular parameter that needs to be measured, especially if there's supplemental disinfection. So if the, the facility is adding chlorine or chlorine dioxide, monochloramine, copper, silver ions to the system, they may have requirements to test certain uh, disinfectants and disinfection byproducts, which um, some of which can be tested with sensors, others need to be tested with handheld devices. So one thing I wanna point out is in deciding for a given facility, what is the ideal combination? Try to automate as much as possible. Um, last year, um, my team looked into data from several water management programs, hundreds of them to determine to what extent were they being fully implemented. So we started with the premise that, um, with the assumption that uh, for a water management program to be effective, successful in reducing the risk of Legionella and other waterborne pathogens, it needs to be comprehensive, first of all. It needs to address all the water systems that should be addressed and, it needs, and devices, and it needs to have all of the control measures and really good specific control measures that should have for those devices and systems. Um, and the other thing is it needs to be implemented, which might seem obvious, but, but those of you involved in water management programs, you know very well, there are a lot of facilities who have a really great document, but it sits on a shelf and, and it doesn't get implemented. So you don't reduce risk 
you don't reduce risk only by what you actually do, not by what you write down. So we looked at we looked at um, a couple, uh, three or four metrics to determine implementation. We knew that the facilities that had these water management plans we were studying, we, that they had comprehensive plans because of the software that, that they used to develop these plans. They can deactivate control measures in the software, but we were going with the assumption that at least they had access to the comprehensive content. So we wanted to find out to what extent were they fully implementing those plans, and we looked at control measure verification compliance. So if you're familiar with ASHRAE 188, you know that periodically it requires that you verify implementation of control measures and other procedures. You review documentation to, to make sure they're being carried out. And um, then we looked at not just numbers of tests, not the, not the test results in this study, but the numbers of tests of Legionella, uh, temperature, and disinfectants in particular. And it was interesting. We we really weren't initially looking for what an impact it had on Legionella results. We just wanted to find out to what extent were they fully implementing them. And we found out that um, what was, well, a couple of things were really interesting. The, the, if you look at this far left column, this is the control measure compliance percentage, meaning the percentage of control measures that were okay. And um, the only 20% of the plans we studied had control measure compliance 80% or greater, which isn't too good. And, um, and only 10% of the facilities were testing for Legionella. Well, let me take that back. 7% uh, had tested at least one test for Legionella in the last 12 months, but only 10% had tested 20 or more samples. So that's probably, uh, you know, unless these were really small facilities and they weren't, um, that probably means they were testing once a year, 20 samples, right? Unless they were testing twice at 10 samples each, it's probably one time a year. So only 10% were doing that. So, um, but the ones who were doing it, like as control measure compliance increased, the numbers of tests increased as well, almost in every category. So not only Legionella, but other microbes, temperatures and disinfectants, which, which clearly showed that the, that the facilities that were engaged in their control measures, keeping up with their control measures, they did everything else too. They did more tests. And here's what's really interesting that we didn't expect, we really weren't looking for this, but we found that as engagement went up in all these categories, Legionella positivity went down. Positivity is the percentage of samples in which Legionella is found in the plumbing system. Um, really linear, linearly, pretty much. Um, it went down as engagement and implementation went up. And keep in mind, um, well, let me say first of all, this, this clearly shows that the premise of ASHRAE 188 is sound. That if a facility will fully implement a comprehensive water management plan, it's going to reduce the risk, at least based on these hundreds of plans we studied, it's going to reduce Legionella, it's going to, redu going to reduce the risk of Legionellosis. But, and here's a big but, the, these were the cream of the crop, by the way. These are the really uh, prestigious facilities. They do most things right. And even among them, the compliance, the degree of implementation was pretty low. And so if you take that in the larger universe of all the facilities that should have water management programs per ASHRAE 188, it's like a dot in terms of the facilities that are really doing a good job. So what does that tell us? And why does this reflect back to what I started to talk about, about automation? Well, some are going to say, well, this just means we need regulations, like we talked about on the panel yesterday. You, you need regulations because facilities are not going to establish water management programs unless they have to, and that's true. But you can't regulate to the extent that to force facilities to do it really well, to have comprehensive plans and to make sure they're fully implemented. You can't um, be that prescriptive and inspect often enough. It just doesn't work, you know, so you have to somehow figure out a way to motivate facilities to want to do the plan well. And I think the real takeaway here is that the plan has to be, the plans have to be easier. Um, the benefits are clear in having a water management plan in terms of reducing legal risk, reducing health risk. Um, and if more facilities were aware of that, they would do it anyway. But if you make it easier for them, they're going to be that much more likely to do it. So, so what could you do, those of you who are involved in designing plumbing systems, if you needed to write a specification 
Um, you probably couldn't include handheld devices because that's that pertains really to the operation and maintenance of the system, right? Um, but you could specify sensors, probably not in multiple locations, but every building would, could use them at the point of entry. And, um, and whether or not they have a building automation system, that's a specification that could apply to any building. And, and even just these parameters, if you, if you uh, specify the installation of sensors at the point of entry for disinfectant residual based on what the city is providing, you would choose that disinfectant. In some cases, you could use ORP instead of the disinfectant, temperature, conductivity, turbidity, and pH. That in itself, although it may not seem like a big deal, it's probably not very expensive. It's not very expensive in a new facility to install that. There is some upkeep, you know, calibration and changing out of these sensors. But you as designers, um, specifiers, that could go a long way in protecting health and life.